Right, come here to me. Let's get settled the way it's there. Purely musically, Zombie by the Cranberries is an absolute banger. The song's gentle verses sound like they were sung by a literal angel, and the kicking in of the chorus's distorted, heavy guitar chords is enough to get anyone's fists pumping. So before you finish tip-topping out that comment below about how great this music sounds anyway, well, I more or less agree with you. Musically, that is. And if I didn't know the full context for the song, I too would assume that it was just another fantastic, vaguely anti-war anthem. Unfortunately, knowing what this song is actually about, understanding its vehemently anti-Irish national liberation message and the disturbing gaslighting that it uses as a vehicle to convey that message, well, let's just say it puts a bit of a dampener on my enthusiasm for the song, to put it mildly. <laughs> Extremely mildly. Do you know what? Fuck it. This song, lyrically, is the absolute worst. Just horrible. And today, I'm gonna try my best to explain why. We'll start by looking at the important general context that it emerged from historically, as well as the tragic specific event that triggered its creation. Then we'll go through the song line by line, explaining everything that's so messed up about it. After looking at the historical context and going through the lyrics, we'll be able to draw some important conclusions that might surprise you about why this song's frankly abhorrent message emerged in the mind of its lyric writer and singer, the late Dolores O'Riordan. And I'll give you a quick hint, it's completely, entirely, unambiguously related to colonialism and its manifestations in Ireland today. Speaking of which, let's begin with a very brief and completely inadequate, multi-century sweeping overview of the context that gave rise to this song's subject matter. In 1169, England began its military aggression towards Ireland with the Anglo-Norman invasion. Over the coming centuries, it would repeatedly attempt to fully capture the country and bring it under direct English colonial control and institute feudalism under their so-called Lordship of Ireland. However, it wasn't until the Cromwellian invasion of the mid-1600s that the ancient communal society of Gaelic Ireland was fully conquered by the English. An event that was, in reality, a genocide that saw the merciless slaughter of over 50% of the native Irish population, tens of thousands captured and sent off to the Caribbean as indentured servants, and a new wave of settler colonizers taking our place here at home. For those native Irish souls who miraculously managed to survive in Ireland, the coming decades and centuries of English and then later British colonial rule were marked by dispossession, displacement and starvation. This culminated in Ungorta Moor, or the Great Famine of the mid-1800s, where British colonial genocidal policies caused the deaths of over a million Irish natives and forced a further two million to have to escape the country for survival. To this day, the population across the 32 counties of Ireland still hasn't recovered to its pre-famine numbers of 8.1 million. However, the Irish have never taken this colonial violence lying down. From the very first moments that the Anglo-Normans set foot on our shores seeking to conquer and subjugate us, the invaders were met head-on with armed resistance from the natives. And when the head-on battles were lost against the vastly more numerous and better equipped colonizing enemies, the natives were forced to turn to low-intensity, hit-and-run guerrilla warfare tactics from the countryside and the mountains. A pattern which emerges time and time again throughout our history. When people today think of Irish armed resistance, they often jump directly to the Irish Republican Army. But this anti-colonial resistance to the English ruling class's aggression against the Irish people has been going on for centuries upon centuries in one form or another. Fast forward now to the period of the anti-colonial conflict that reignited in the late 1960s, known internationally as the Troubles. Despite all odds, the Irish resistance had finally developed a fighting force that even the 1992 British Prime Minister himself, John Major, was forced to admit couldn't be defeated militarily. Through a sophisticated campaign of guerrilla warfare rooted deeply among the most oppressed masses of the people, this relatively small group of resistance fighters had managed to successfully bring one of the world's largest, most advanced imperialist military powers to its knees. However, when the fighting was confined solely to Ireland, primarily in the openly militarily occupied northern six counties, the English ruling classes could more easily ignore the spot of trouble happening over in Ireland, which was, in reality, nothing short of an all-out war of national liberation. 
So to make the English ruling classes themselves confront the brutal reality of their imperialist aggression abroad, one of the tactics that the Irish liberationists used was to bring the war directly to the heart of the beast in England. Just as England had brought war to Ireland for the previous 800 years. However, unlike Cromwell's genocidal campaign that indiscriminately, mercilessly slaughtered hundreds of thousands of unarmed Irish civilians in the most brutal and barbaric ways imaginable, the Irish liberationists never considered any civilians to be legitimate targets and consequently did everything in their power to limit civilian casualties as much as was possible. So when they attacked key points of infrastructure and other sites in England in order to make the colonial occupation economically unsustainable and force a British withdrawal from Ireland, the Irish liberationists provided precise bomb warnings to the authorities in advance so that the population could be evacuated from the area and civilian lives would be protected. A stark contrast to the merciless colonial violence of the British imperialist military forces, as well as their settler colonizer loyalist paramilitary servants with whom they colluded. However, British state forces sometimes failed to heed the clear, precise warnings provided by the Irish liberationists for impending actions. And this, unfortunately, led to the tragic loss of civilian life. Now, sometimes this was the result of genuine incompetence on behalf of the British state forces. And other times, the warnings were intentionally ignored so as to demonise Irish liberationists, painting them as bloodthirsty, heartless murderers rather than heroic freedom fighters. The song Zombie by the Cranberries, whose lyrics were written by the Limerick born Irish lead singer Dolores O'Riordan, was written in response to one of these bombings in England. On the 20th of March 1993, both the Samaritans and the Merseyside police force themselves directly were informed by Irish liberationists of the precise locations where two bombs were to go off on Bridge Street, Warrington, England. The British state forces failed to act on these warnings and the bombs exploded, leading to the tragic deaths of two children and 56 people injured. The following day, the Irish liberationists released a statement explaining that Responsibility for the tragic and deeply regrettable death and injuries caused in Warrington yesterday lies squarely at the door of those in the British authorities who deliberately failed to act on precise and adequate warnings. The Cranberries had been touring Britain at the time, and lead singer Dolores O'Riordan, seeing an interview with the heartbroken, grieving mother of one of the children who had tragically lost their lives, was furious at what she perceived to be a senseless, unprovoked act of violence, and decided to put pen to paper in condemnation of the Irish liberationists for what had happened. With this broad historical and specific context in mind, let's take a look now at precisely what she wrote line by line. The song's lyrics open by painting the sorrowful picture of the fallout of the Warrington bombing. Another head hangs lowly, child is slowly taken. And the violence caused such silence, who are we mistaken? So it begins by referring directly to the mournful response of the general public in Britain that O'Riordan had witnessed in the wake of the tragic death of two children from the explosion. This is understandable. The death of children under no circumstances will ever be okay, nor indeed the unnecessary loss of any life whatsoever. O'Riordan then proceeds to take what appears to be a firm stance against violence, noting the resulting speechlessness that the explosion had caused its witnesses. You might begin to think at this point that this is simply a song that takes a principled opposition to all war and violence in general. A song of a sort of pacifist rebellion in its own right. However, with the historical context provided earlier in this video, you might also prod slightly deeper and question Dolores O'Riordan's own silence about the British colonial violence enacted against the Irish people for more than eight centuries. Colonial violence which caused the deaths of countless forgotten nameless children. Dolores O'Riordan curiously has nothing to say about the innumerable massacres against Irish natives committed by English and later British imperialist military forces in Ireland, nor indeed the repeated attempted ethnic cleansings by fascist loyalists. Rather than speaking out against the imperialists and the fascists, she instead chooses to solely condemn the legitimate resistance to genocidal colonial aggression of those who, in the words from their own 1977 Green Book that all volunteers were sworn to uphold, 
We're fighting to establish a democratic and socialist state across the 32 counties of Ireland. Strange, da. Now you may say that I'm being a bit unfair here in assuming that O'Riordan's condemnation is targeted solely at Irish liberationists rather than simply all people who would behave violently. So let's proceed to look at the lines that immediately follow. But you see, it's not me. It's not my family. These words might initially appear somewhat ambiguous and difficult to decipher, but fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, Dolores O'Riordan explained their meaning in precise terms to the English magazine Vox, stating that The IRA are not me. I'm not the IRA. The Cranberries are not the IRA. My family are not. When it says in the song, it's not me, it's not my family, that's what I'm saying. Here speaking directly to the English, O'Riordan was evidently desperate to convey from the outset of this song that I'm not like other Irish people, those barbarians. I'm one of the good ones. Please graciously grant me your approval, English masters. This has long been a typical attitude of the cosy middle-class Irish artist at peace with imperialism who courts English approval and is, as James Connolly would say, born with an apology in mouth. This is a manifestation of what's known as Malinchism, or cultural cringe. A widely documented phenomenon where colonised people view their own culture as inferior, here Irish culture, to the culture of the coloniser, here the English ruling classes. It's a product of the process of colonialism and cultural genocide that's occurred, wherein its victims suffer a form of colonial Stockholm Syndrome. In Ireland today, such Anglophilic individuals are referred to with utmost disdain as West Brits, such as these lads. Once Dolores O'Riordan's apologies to England for the behaviour of those filthy barbaric Irish savages are out of the way, she next turns to addressing Irish liberationists directly, stating that In your head, in your head, they are fighting, with their tanks and their bombs and their bombs and their guns, in your head, in your head, they are crying. Where to begin with this? Apparently, all the colonial violence and aggression against the Irish people of the past eight and a half centuries is simply in the heads of Irish liberationists. They're all crazy, unhinged lunatics with no grasp on reality who are simply imagining oppression where there is none. Because Dolores O'Riordan herself personally wasn't able to see it and apparently object permanence simply doesn't exist. Hell, the British military doesn't even have tanks or bombs or guns. That's all just in your head, apparently. <clears throat> Let's take a quick step back here for a minute because if you're watching the music video of Zombie as opposed to just listening to its lyrics, you're gonna notice some strong mixed messaging. The music video was filmed by the American cinematographer Samuel Boyer, who also directed numerous popular 1990s music videos such as Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit and the resulting visual reality of what Boyer captured on film when he travelled to Belfast is strikingly different to the picture painted by Dolores O'Riordan. While O'Riordan's lyrics are targeted squarely against Irish liberationists, Boyer's video as a result of Boyer himself approaching the conflict from the very different USA-born context attempts to present a generic all sides are equally culpable anti-war message. The sort of general anti-war message that the song Zombie itself is widely believed to represent. But in the music video, you don't see the streets being terrorised by the Irish liberationists that O'Riordan is so quick to condemn. Instead, only British military forces. The closest thing we see to the Irish liberationists are some children play fighting and some Irish Republican murals. Which of course are balanced out for good measure with loyalist murals too, because my both sides. The stark contrast between what's shown visually in the music video and what's sung in the lyrics is almost comical as, in the lyrics, O'Riordan repeatedly asserts that it's just in your head that they're fighting with their tanks and their bombs and their bombs and their guns in your head. Meanwhile, you can literally see for yourself in the song's own official music video, British military forces with their guns and their bombs and their armoured vehicles. But apparently, this thing that you're seeing on the screen is all just in your head. It's not real. You're just imagining things. All the systemic oppression and brutal injustices faced by Irish natives living in the gerrymandered six-county settler colonial sectarian statelet, that's all just in your head. 
The Bogside Massacre of 1972, when British soldiers opened fire on unarmed civilians who'd been attending a peaceful civil rights demonstration in Derry, killing 14 civilians and seriously injuring dozens. In your head. Double the number of Catholics as Protestants arrested and charged from 2016 to 2020 in the six counties according to RUC statistics, despite a more or less 50-50 population today. In your head. Collusion between the colonial state forces and fascist loyalist paramilitaries, which led to countless cold-blooded murders down the years like the Miami Showband Massacre, as well as those in the 1990s when O'Reardon was writing, such as the 1992 Sean Graham Bookmaker Massacre for which the British Colonial Police Force, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, are proven to have given the terrorists the guns. In your head. It's all just in your head. Always has been. Do you see what's going on here, yeah? Nothing short of the most extreme, blatant gaslighting imaginable. Returning to the lyrics, O'Reardon carries on with the political gaslighting and introduces a charming insult to Boo. In your head, in your head, zombie, zombie, zombie. What's in your head, in your head, zombie, zombie, zombie. Beyond the obnoxious, blatant political gaslighting, we're now forced to ask, who is the titular zombie? You might, or you might not, be surprised to learn that the answer is not simply anyone who would engage in violence, like the imperialist British military forces or the fascist loyalist paramilitaries, but specifically and solely Irish national liberationists, that is, Irish Republicans. From the aforementioned interview with the English magazine Vox, Dolores wonders simply, incredulously, what a person is thinking when they detonate a bomb in a shopping arcade. What's in your head, zombie? She demands. What's in your head, you stupid, unthinking, mindless zombie? What's in the head of the people that Dolores O'Riordan deems to be zombies is knowledge. The knowledge of over 800 years of history of some of the most horrifying colonial aggression imaginable of countless brutal massacres, of scorched earth policies which destroyed our land, our flora, our fauna and polluted our waterways, intentionally making the country uninhabitable and artificially creating innumerable famines, of the dispossession, displacement and starvation of the penal laws, of the fundamental injustice of the creation of the gerrymandered six county Protestant supremacist settler colonial statelet created by British imperialism specifically to subvert the democratic will of the people of the entire 32 counties of Ireland who voted in 1918 overwhelmingly in favour of the establishment of the independent 32 county People's Irish Republic that was proclaimed in arms in 1916 and finally established in 1919. This 32 county People's Irish Republic was then strangled in the cradle by the forces of imperialism and counter revolution in 1921, which partitioned the country and introduced not one but two carnivals of reaction, north and south of the British imposed border on this island the following year. That's what's in the head of these so called zombies, Dolores. Knowledge. Knowledge and the courage to stand up and fight for freedom to break the chains of British imperialism upon this country once and for all. Moving on now to the second verse, O'Riordan writes that Another mother's breaking heart is taken over. When the violence causes silence, we must be mistaken. Here we have a reference to what caused O'Riordan's strong emotional reaction to this bombing in Warrington. An interview with the grieving mother of one of the children who tragically lost their lives in the explosion. Which is understandable. It was an awful thing to have happened. But let's zoom out for a second and put this in its historical perspective. This event occurred after 823 years of English colonial violence against the Irish people. Colonial violence that, again, included artificially created famines, scorched earth policies, and the brutal open slaughter of countless unnamed and forgotten souls. Nothing short of literal physical genocide, alongside of course, cultural genocide. These mountains of mangled millions, these murdered children of Ireland, merited not so much as a passing mention from O'Riordan. But two English children unintentionally losing their lives despite Irish liberationists giving precise warnings in advance in order to protect them 
Well, time to write a hit song about it, to garner English approval and cash in on the rising anti-Irish liberation sentiment internationally by condemning those who fought for freedom and the end of eight centuries of colonial violence in a spectacularly, grotesquely ignorant anti-Irish liberation anthem. Here we see the glaringly obvious double standards at play. There's one set of rules for the oppressed, who are utterly condemnable for engaging in physical force resistance, and another set of rules for the oppressors, whose imperialist and fascist violence is absolutely fine. But also actually doesn't even exist, and is really just in your head, zombie. Remember, British state forces didn't provide advanced warnings before they gunned down 26 unarmed innocent peaceful protesters on Bloody Sunday. They intended to slaughter those who were politically inconvenient to the settler colonial regime. Similarly, fascist loyalists didn't provide bomb warnings in advance of the Dublin and Monaghan bombings. They intentionally set out to maximise civilian deaths, even down to making sure that the bombs went off during rush hour at 5.30pm when civilians would have just left work. But of course, complete silence from O'Riordan and the Cranberries on these matters. Kale fucking surprise. The Irish liberationists, on the other hand, did give warnings because their intention was to protect civilian life. Of course, the British authorities will deny they gave adequate warnings, and I'm sure they're trustworthy on the matter. It's not like British state forces have ever willfully ignored bomb warnings in order to demonise Irish Republicans or anything like that. Never. Anyway, O'Riordan continues, and this is where her position really becomes clear. It's the same old theme since 1916. These particular lines, referring back to the heroic Easter Rising of 1916, are where O'Riordan finally shows her true colours. You see, in Ireland, there's a common narrative that you're gonna hear that the Irish Republicans who fought British colonialism in the past were good, while those who do it in the present are bad. It's a very safe, moderate position to hold. While at the time that O'Riordan was writing Zombie in the early 1990s, there were mixed feelings across the island about the contemporary Irish Republican armed struggle. The Easter Rising of 1916, by contrast, given the historical distance, was almost universally revered as a heroic moment of immense sacrifice in the name of the freedom of the Irish people. In these lines, O'Riordan is rejecting even the safe, moderate position of supporting only the historic revolutionaries who had now put down their guns. In fact, O'Riordan here is going as far as to condemn the heroic martyrs of 1916 just as strongly as she's condemning the Irish liberationists of the 1990s, all of whom are apparently just brainless zombies rehashing the same old theme since 1916. With these words, she's condemning the struggle for Irish freedom in its totality, condemning the anti-colonial egalitarian struggle of Irish republicanism, and in doing so, she's siding decisively with British imperialism and colonialism, rather than siding with the oppressed in pursuit of liberation. Up until this point in the song, you might have been able to argue that O'Riordan was only criticising the specific individuals who'd carried out the bombing in Warrington or, at most, the then-current Provisional Republican Armed Campaign. But these lines show what she really thinks. That the great martyrs of the 1916 Rising, like James Connolly and Patrick Pearce, who gave their lives fighting imperialism for a fairer, more just, egalitarian Ireland too, were simply just mindless zombies. According to the almighty, enlightened, omniscient, galaxy-brained Dolores O'Riordan. It's also tragically ironic that O'Riordan is claiming that it's the Irish liberationists who are these stupid, unthinking, brainless zombies, given how blatantly historically ignorant she is. This is clear when she claims that it's the same old theme since 1916. She seems to think that revolutionary republicanism began with 1916's Easter Rising. She evidently knows nothing of the uprisings of Wolf Tone's United Irishmen in 1798, of Robert Emmett's in 1803, of the Young Irelanders in 1848, of the Fenian Rising of 1867, of the Fenian campaigns in England in the 1880s, nor indeed anything of the six centuries of anti-colonial resistance that took place prior to the formal establishment of revolutionary Irish republicanism going all the way back to the Anglo-Norman invasion of 1169. 
Nothing, not even so much as a passing reference to these monumental events is mentioned in the song. Instead, O'Riordan simply continues with the malinchist political gaslighting born of her own historical ignorance and her own desperate desire for approval from the English ruling classes. In your head, in your head, they're still fighting, with their tanks and their bombs and their bombs and their guns, in your head, in your head, they are dying. Of course, despite what this gaslighting might lead you to believe, the British state forces were still fighting Irish liberationists by the 1990s often using loyalist death squads to do their dirtiest work, such as the Sean Graham Bookmaker Massacre. But I'm starting to sound like a broken record at this stage, so we'll move on. The song finishes with the chorus once more. In your head, in your head, zombie, zombie, zombie. What's in your head, in your head, zombie, 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 e, 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 random sounds, etc, etc. Which are probably the best part of the song, to be honest with you. So, once again, gaslighting and insulting those who support Irish liberation as mere mindless zombies. First, by reasserting that colonial oppression is simply in their heads, then slightly shifting tone and demanding to know what's in your heads. The answer to which, as discussed earlier, was knowledge and the courage to stand up and fight back. So, to wrap things up now, a few closing thoughts about what this all means. While it's a shame that a song with such a backward message that serves no one and nothing but the interests of colonialism and imperialism would go on to become such a massive international hit, and despite the tone of this video so far, I don't fully blame Dolores O'Riordan herself as an individual for having these thoughts and putting them to paper. Her thoughts are the product of neo-colonial society the 26 county free state known internationally as the Republic of Ireland. The whole point of neo-colonialism, as opposed to old-style open colonialism such as that in the northern six counties, is that neo-colonialism is hidden. You can't necessarily see it, until someone points it out to you, that is. You can't see the senior Irish government officials who are actually British military intelligence agents. You can't see the head of the Irish police forces links to the British state's colonial project as the RUC's chief constable. You can't see the British state ownership of Rosslare Harbour in Wexford. You can't see the anti-constitutional British control of Irish airspace. You can't see the British feudal ownership of the land on which the Irish government buildings and Dublin Castle themselves are built nor the ground rents being paid by the Irish state itself directly to British feudalist landlords like the Earl of Pembroke, the Duke of Leinster, Lord Longford and the Viscount de Desgy. Feudal ground rents which, by the way, are paid for using our taxes, meaning we're all still collectively subjected to a level of literal peasant exploitation by feudal landlords. Today, in 2023, these neo-colonial facts all remain hidden under a flag of nominal political independence. Meanwhile, the very same colonial exploitation and control continues behind the curtains. Dolores O'Riordan's own personal political consciousness is that of someone who's had the wool pulled over her eyes by the neo-colonial environment in which she was raised. However, where she does shoulder some blame is in the fact that she's not only a passive victim of neo-colonial brainwashing, but through these lyrics, she herself is pulling the wool over the eyes of others who might otherwise more clearly see the colonial domination still at play. She's attacking the Irish National Liberation Movement, asserting that colonial oppression, which we can see with our own eyes and can even measure with numerous concrete statistics, is simply a myth that it's all just an imaginary victim complex that we've all collectively conjured up in our heads. This song then, and its lyrics specifically, becomes itself part of the justifying ideology for imperialist colonial aggression in Ireland. Part of the neo-colonial superstructure reinforcing the colonial and semi-colonial economic base that exists across the island to this day. The state that Dolores O'Riordan was born into, the so-called Republic of Ireland, has been specifically set up to function as a servant for imperialist powers from abroad. 
be that as a tax haven for multinational enterprises to avoid paying taxes through mechanisms like the double Irish arrangement, or as a pit stop for US warplanes refueling in Shannon Airport before once more taking flights to terrorise innocent civilians in West Asia. Zombie by the Cranberries is just another product of such a neo-colonial society, which serves not the interests of normal working people struggling to get by, but instead, in condemning the justified resistance to oppression, this song, like the state itself, solely serves the interests of the international imperialist ruling classes and their native Irish comprador lackeys. Even if the song is, purely musically, an absolute banger. Gurv mila mahagwiv, agus slangafowl.